Okay, welcome to Deep Weird Dialogues with me, Dr. Jack Hunter, where I'm talking to contributors to the book Deep Weird about their chapters and some of the ideas that are contained within them. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. David Luke, a parapsychologist and psych uh, psychedelic researcher. And he's going to talk to us about his chapter on disembodied eyes. <laughs> so this chapter is um, an ontological investigation into the nature of psychedelic entities. And it's inspired by an experience that you had. So I wonder if you could, first of all, just tell us about that experience. Yeah, sure. Um, it's with uh, DMT, which is kind of naturally occurring a uh, psychedelic molecule which is naturally occurring in the human body and found pretty much where everywhere in nature apart from in fungi and insects curiously and uh, I, I dabbled with DMT quite a bit at this point but this was um, this is actually my last last DMT trip for quite a long time actually uh, and I'd had many experiences prior to that uh, but it got to the point where often you'd have these entity encounters on pretty much every experience but on this occasion well, prior to this occasion, the last two trips, that the entities would go like, "What are you doing here? We've shown you enough. You just, you just trot on. You know, there's nothing here for you to see anymore." And I was like, "But guys, come on, this is so fascinating. Let me have a look." And then I had this experience, which kind of stopped me going back for a while. <laughs> so, what did you, what did you see? Uh, so. <clears throat> I happened to be on the banks of the river Ganges, uh, up near the border with, with Tibet, and uh, I just kind of girded myself for, 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 for whatever may come as a bit of a, an improvised ritual. And uh, this time I kind of kind of burst through the veil and there was this being there on the other side immediately. Mm. And uh, it kind of looked surprised that I, I was there. I mean, quite literally looked because it, suddenly all these eyeballs appeared and were kind of like, ooh, what's going on here? And was looking at me. But I kind of saw something over the kind of vaguely what you might describe as its shoulder, uh, although it didn't have any shoulders, uh, and saw this thing, which I, I've now blocked out of my memory, but it was like like the Holy Grail, the, the thing you should not see and live. The Holy uh, of Holies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the kind of the, the forbidden, you know, the, the holiest of holies or something. And this thing kind of plopped me, kind of gulping at it, and suddenly it was like kind of turned to me and was like all these eyes appeared. Uh, and it was basically composed of um, just this kind of writhing, squirming, geometrical, Fibonacci, spiralesque tendrils of like snake bodies and eyeballs, all in this kind of rhythmic geometrical arrangement. And uh, was just kind of basically put the willies up me and yeah. uh, just kind of writhing around and hypnotizing me. And I just basically went, okay. Uh, it was pretty menacing, I have to say and uh, felt extremely real and yeah. was not happy at me being there. Uh, so it was sort of like some kind of a threshold guardian or a... Yeah, it kind of felt like that, yeah. That you could <laughs> you could say that. Yeah. Um, and I guess the interesting thing was, and I mean, it hadn't occurred to me at the time it was a threshold guardian, but uh, uh, a, a while afterwards, I was doing some research on something else. I come across this book, on Tibetan demonology, uh, which I, I had, uh, or Tibetan magic actually, and I was gonna send it to my colleague, Serena Roni Dougal, who was doing some research with, she was working in Tibetan monasteries at the time. I thought she'll make more use of this book than I will. I hadn't looked at it, and I, I just had a quick flick through, and I saw these images of this Tibetan protector deity uh, called Tsar, uh, who has like serpent bodies and is covered in thousands of eyeballs, and I was like, oh, that looked a little bit familiar. Yeah. Uh, and um, also concordant with that, I also was doing some survey research on people's paranormal experiences with psychedelics. And one of the, the, the respondents had said how they'd encountered this thing with all these kind of, they described them as tentacles, but all these serpents all over it, uh, sorry, eyeballs all over it, and it really terrified them. And then I got to kind of doing some searching on the internet of people's trip reports, and sure enough, quite a few other encounters appeared, particularly with DMT, but a few also with uh, mushroom psilocybin and LSD as well. Mm -hmm. And they all seemingly naive and independently of everyone else. Uh, but they, they all they all had the same kind of content to the experience of encountering this kind of multi-eyed serpent-like beastie uh, in a kind of geometric style, threatening them in the most terrifying way. 
and uh, generally from the Willie Devil, who <laughs> had done me. And, uh, and then I kind of came across other depictions of, of similar beings across a whole range of different mythologies, not just in this Tibetan, but um, uh, there's a list here of like uh, uh, Azriel, the angel of death, who had already encountered in a dream, Azza, Shemyaza, which is a Persian version, Persian version, uh, Az Hadaha, uh, Zahak, Azizahaka, Zar, Azazel, um, all the way from the kind of Middle East all the way to Tibet, you see this kind of similar being. And it's often like a guardian of the threshold, lord of the underworld, um, the watcher, and so on, and always associated with the serpent. And it's like, wow, I don't know if this is some kind of prototypical kind of encounter experience. Um, so I didn't really know how to, to consider that. Uh, I put forward a few ideas uh, that it may be some kind of archetypal encounter. Um, it certainly seems that uh, people have encounters with a very similar kind of entity, naively, often on psychedelics, though not always. I, I met a, a young boy of, uh, he was about six at the time, who described encountering the same being um, every few nights in a hypnagogic state and, and basically hung out with him all the time. But he's kind of synonymous with, with the kind of angel of death, you see, in a lot of these mythologies. Um, That's great. Kind of guardian of the threshold, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that, that kind of unnerved me a little bit. And I don't necessarily know how to explain it. There could be some good basic neurochemical, neurobiological reasons for why people traditionally maybe in mythological times encountered this being and perhaps through endogenous DMT, spontaneous release, and why people then naively on psychedelics have similar experiences. Um, but it, it, it begs a, a few few questions. And uh, more recently, in fact, quite weirdly, I just moved into this new place uh, about six months ago. And just before I moved in, the new uh, kind of TV version of uh, The Sandman uh, came on Netflix. Yeah. And it was like, oh, great, in the very first episode, <laughs> It's uh, it's set in this house in in Witch Cross in East Sussex called Forney Ridge, um, which turns out it's the house I'm moving into, and they basically try and do this <laughs> invocation, evocation in the in the basement uh, to capture the Angel of Death, uh, but they end up capturing Dream instead, who they keep locked in the basement for the next hundred years, and that turns out it's the house I've moved into. So the the story just keeps on giving getting weirder, getting weirder and weirder all the time. I haven't found a way into the basement yet, though. There isn't one, apparently. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Maybe an astral basement. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So thank you very much, David. If you're interested in finding out more about David's experiences on DMT and his ontological investigations, check out Deep Weird. Thank you very much. Oh.